To the economy then. I guess it's been a good week. The masks are off. And there has been, I think, a perceptible rise in morale in the country as a result of that. And the feeling that maybe we are now looking towards a post-COVID world. We hear reports that the issues of supply chains are perhaps uh, improving. Uh, More products, goods and products are flowing across borders and into uh, shops, which you can now go and shop in without having that silly piece, that silly face nappy on. But are we going to bounce back that quickly? Is our economy going to recover when we have things like school shortages and unemployment so low that it is stymieing um, economic activity? To discuss uh, all this uh, without emotion, uh, we are joined uh, from Bagri Economics by independent economist Cameron Bagri. Cam, good to talk to you again, uh, mate. Is it all, oh, love and kisses now? Are we over the worst of it? Are uh, the good times going to roll? Well, I guess we're getting back to a semblance of a little bit more normal life post-COVID, although we can still debate what normality is going to look like. But I guess if you step back at the moment and step aside from COVID, the big overarching theme out there in New Zealand and around the globe, it's this thief. And it's this thief called inflation that's turning up and stealing all our money. And inflations are on the warpath. Sorry, central banks are on a warpath. We saw a real bad inflation print at the United States a couple of nights ago, and the market reaction was pretty brutal. Uh, Equities are down 4%, and the NASDAQ was down 5%. And that's the next battleground we've got to face going forward, is that you contain the inflation. Inflation is not growth. It's not asset price friendly. So we're in what's called the understage of the economic cycle. We've outperformed. We've knocked the ball out of the park over the past couple of years as we've been dosed up in what's called sugar candy economics. But the next couple of years, unfortunately, involves a a bit of payback on the other side. What does that mean, Cameron? Not, I guess, for the numbers on the spreadsheet. What does that mean for the average citizen in in a country like New Zealand? Where does high inflation and possible recession hurt them or impact their day-to-day lives? Well, the, the immediate one which people are noticing right here and there is what's happening across the property market. The residential property market, of course, soared over 2020 and 2021. Well, if you look at the last nine months, your property prices have fallen back. Your property prices in Auckland are down 16% odd from their peak in November last year. They're down at about 10% from their peak across the broader country. So we're giving back a lot of those wealth gains. And, of course, if you give back wealth gains, you don't feel as wealthy, so you're less inclined to spend. And what we've seen is that retail sales, volumes-wise, over the March and the June quarter have started to pair back as well. So, yeah, hey, presto, monetary policy works. Yeah, When you lift interest rates, you siphon money out of the economy because your mortgage costs start to, to go out. What the Reserve Bank also needs to see, unfortunately, is to contain inflation. They need to see unemployment move up. Now, that's the nasty side effect here. We're trying to yeah, pick, pick your bigger evil. Is it inflation or the unemployment rate? Yeah, but we're in what's called a, a zone where we're exceeding what's called maximum sustainable employment, which is a fancy way of saying there's too few workers, the unemployment rate is too low. Yeah, how do we get unemployment back up? Well, you break a few economic bones by like, setting the economy on what's called a slow growth trajectory. And, and that's the trajectory we are going to be on for the next two to, two to three years. Uh, inflation's a pretty simple story. You've got a mismatch between demand and supply. At the moment, we've got too much money t- facing too few goods. Yeah, so the Reserve Bank is turning down the heat on that demand side of the equation pretty aggressively. Cameron, does this mean that we overdid the stimulus during COVID? We over-primed the pump. And now yeah, we've flooded that, the engine, if you like. Yeah, and, and there's a whole lot of things, Sean, that have, <coughs> excuse me, that have gone on. Look, look one, it was, there was probably an excessive use of what we call sugar candy economics. Yeah, cutting interest rates was fine, but you sort of question, did we really need that, the extent of that large-scale asset program? Did we really need to bring in the funding for lending program? The government went big, which is, you know, the right thing to do, to go, but, you know, pushing $60 billion into the New Zealand economy over a 12- to 24-month period is absolutely massive. And, of course, what also come along was a whole lot of supply shocks. Yeah, whether it be COVID, whether it be the Ukraine situation, which is adding the food prices around the globe. So we, we got a little bit of a perfect storm. You know, the laws of economics 
are back in play. When you print a lot of money, you spend a lot of money, and you have supply shocks where you've got a recipe for inflation, which is what we're seeing around the globe. Now, those supply shocks are going to start to dissipate, but the challenge here is still there's a lot of liquidity around the globe. Interest rates are still low if you look at them in a historical sense. You know, so central banks are into the, I guess, the hard yard stage of the cycle where they've got to dish out a few economic hits to tame inflation. You know, inflation does not work for anyone. As I said earlier on, it's a, it's a big thief that, that steals your money. And we're in a bit of a quagmire here because you know, the rules of engagement in regard to taming inflation, it's not friendly for growth. It's not friendly for asset prices. It tends to be negative for both, but of course letting inflation stick around is not great either. Is there anything policy setting wise that a government in New Zealand can do or should be doing to dodge this bullet? Well, it's not a question of dodging, but they can certainly help you. Yeah, Adrian Nor needs what's called a few mates. And yeah, those those mates that they need really come from, from central government. And there's a couple of things that they can be doing. Look, one, the last thing we want to see in the 2023 budget is a repeat of the big spending impulse we saw in the 2022 budget. Yeah, yeah, what are, now, Cameron, what are the chances? It's election year. Of course they're going to lolly well, scramble and it. <clears throat> well, and that's, that, that, that's the problem. We're, we're going to face a choice here. If, if the government spends big in the election year budget, yeah, rolls out the lollies, then odds are the Reserve Bank needs to lift interest rates even more, and that's going to hit middle-income families particularly if you've got a, a pretty large mortgage out there. So the, the, the right thing to do through a macroeconomic, you know, economic lens is to go pretty tight on that spending within next year's budget. Now, politically, that might be too tough to deliver. The other thing that yeah, the government can be doing is shifting the emphasis away from demand towards the supply. You know, supply is about... You know, the economic capability around New Zealand in regard to productivity, the availability of labour, and a big one in regard to availability of labour is just immigration settings. And we need to be loosening up immigration settings because at the moment the big strangling effect out there across the business sector is actually just finding skilled and unskilled workers. You go down to Queenstown, half the restaurants are shut, you can't get a rental car, you can't get a taxi. You know, these sort of things are holding New Zealand back. And getting inflation down is, is a simple equation. You need to bludgeon the hell out of demand or you boost supply. Now, I know what's the more friendly aversion in regard to getting inflation under control. It's boosting supply as opposed to bludgeoning demand. Cameron, on a bigger, and, and I know inflation and recession are, are big issues, in the bigger picture, has anything fundamentally changed as a result of COVID about the world's economy? and the way it works? Or are we going to get back to the way things were before? No, I think a whole lot of things have changed. And it's not just, you know, COVID, sure. Let, let, let's think about, for the past 10, 20, 30 years, we've been in a, a reasonably harmonious, globally connected world. You know, globalisation has ruled. You know, we've been out there, yeah, outsourcing stuff up to China, but globalisation has already meant the availability of cheap imports and that, that's helped keep inflation down. Where are we now, right here and now? Security <clears throat> is dictating trade, and it's security on three levels. It's security in food, it's security in energy, and it's security in technology. You know, security in those microchips, because the microchips control the computers and the computers control the machines. So the whole globalised world we've been used to is fundamentally different. Yeah, we've been used to a low inflation environment. Well, it doesn't look like we're going to be in a low inflation environment for a number of years. That means more economic volatility. We're in a rising interest rate environment as opposed to a falling interest rate environment. You know, society's expectations of the social safety net have fundamentally shifted post-COVID. You know, Post-COVID, we need to be shoring up the health system, your border security. That ties up resources. You, know, you can go through on a whole lot of different levels, Sean, that things have fundamentally shifted on a whole lot of levels in a permanent sense. You know, probably the big one was the one I set out at the start, was this whole idea of globalisation that is now on tenderhooks, and we're starting to think a lot more inward locally as opposed to externally. And, and how we can become self-sufficient or more less reliant on globalisation in case something like this happens again, I guess, Cameron? 
Well, you see, and you think about, yeah, this, we used to have this thing called Marsden Pointer Refinery. Yeah. Now that, that's gone, yeah, and suddenly that becomes a big major point of vulnerability because we didn't put a risk management framework around that. Yeah, I hear you. I thank you very much, as always, for your time, Cam. We've got to catch up soon. That is uh, Cameron okay. Bagri from uh, Bagri Economics. Yep, recession is still coming. You might have your mask off, but there's still some economic pain on the way, and it doesn't sound... It doesn't sound, folks, like there's an easy out there. Um, there is no uh, silver bullet. Um, Sean, we still have bags of skills, have bags of money, stimulate demand for skills. Yeah, maybe maybe that's an idea. Sean, maybe we could have a reset and build back better. Maybe we'll own nothing and be quite happy, says Dave. Oh, yeah, that was the great reset theory, which never really happened, does it? You know what drives and motivates people, their happiness, their desire for love and greed. Uh, greed is quite a motivator these days. Look, I want to make special mention of our mate Carl who rang in yesterday on behalf of Countdown, who made a little bit of a mess up. Um, we have had remarkable response to Carl. And also I've got to say some same-sex interest in Ben, my producer. Um, but... <laughs> But, um, Carl, uh, I know you're out there, mate. We have got the T-shirt and the mug going to you, and you just did stealing service. I just think not just for Countdown, but indeed for the platform yesterday. And the interview with Carl is its own separate podcast on our app, so you can get that. And then we've, we've got Ben, who is apparently quite cute to some people, Ben explaining the claim we got, and then the call we did, to the lady from Countdown um, who'd had a bad day yesterday, I imagine. That's a separate uh, podcast, and we've got the video and audio of that, and they've already been seen thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Um, you are more than welcome to go and access those. It's always nice to make a piece of content. Um, and it's, I wouldn't say it's gone viral. I wouldn't say it's spread like Omicron, but a few people have got sick from it, which is great.